Hello again, my name is Nick, and thanks for joining me in this series, Jesus in the Gospels. Last week in our Gospel survey, we went through the time period of Antiochus IV Epiphanes to Herod the Great. And in that lesson, we finished with the death of Herod the Great while discussing the rise of various different religious sects that rose out of the Maccabean area. This again was in part due to Greek cultural influence, also known as Hellenism which led to differing religious views, corruption in leadership, and politics to name a few. And this also gave rise to some groups that we're going to examine today. Some of them are mentioned in the Gospels and some of them are not. But each one of these religious sects held to differing interpretations of how they understood Torah or the Law of Moses and why Israel was under Roman occupation among other things. So we're going to look at the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Zealots, Scribes, Herodians, and the Essenes. Now while there was diversity in some of these religious groups about certain details, they were nonetheless unified on certain beliefs. What do you think some of those beliefs were? Four Jewish Beliefs Monotheism or One God Any committed Jew adhered to the unique oneness of God. Unlike all other religious systems that were polytheistic, Judaism was fiercely monotheistic, believing in one God. And that one God was the creator of the heavens and the earth, and all other gods were worthless idols that were unworthy of worship. Israel was a covenant people. Israel believed that the one true God entered into a unique covenantal relationship with them. This covenant was originally initiated with Abraham back in Genesis 12 and 15, and circumcision was a sign or a seal of that covenant promise. Confirmation of this covenant between God and Israel came later through the exodus from Egypt and the giving of the Torah or the law. Because of this covenantal agreement, Israel was called to remain faithful to the precepts or rules that God delineated to them through Moses in the Ten Commandments and the various laws in Leviticus 17 through 20 that consisted of both case laws and statute laws. An example of case laws is, if someone does this, you are to do this. For example, if someone deliberately seeks to injure you and does, then equal punishment will ensue. Statute laws are do not do this or universal laws that stretch through the eons of time that are universally accepted as wrong murder rape or racism to name a few faithfulness promised blessings while unfaithfulness would lead to exile and curses you know faithfulness to the covenant promised blessings from god while disobedience led to judgment and exile while the jews debated many things they all agreed that adherence to the Sabbath, belief in one God, circumcision, dietary laws, and cleanliness were given from God directly to the Israelites. The Pharisees. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about them. Without a doubt, the two most prominent religious groups mentioned in the Gospels are those of the Pharisaic and Sadducean sects. Let's first look at the Pharisees. Now remember, we are not completely sure when this religious sect emerged, but the general consensus is that sometime during or after the Maccabean Revolt, this group of separate ones, which is what Pharisee means, appear around the reign of John Hacranus in 135 to 105 BC. Now, according to Flavius Josephus, a first century eyewitness, he states that the Pharisees are a group of Jews of excelling the rest of their nation in the observance of religion and as exact exponents of the laws. That's found in Jewish Wars, Book 1, Volume 2. So these Pharisees were what we would call guardians or gatekeepers of the law, but not just the written law or the Mosaic law. They also had a set of traditions or 
oral laws which greatly expanded on the written law. This is known as the traditions of the elders in Mark 7, 3 through 5. And contrary to how a lot of people think about the Pharisees in negative terms based on Jesus' encounters with them in the Gospels, there's sort of a skewing of our view, giving us a tendency of thinking they were a despised or hated group, but they were actually greatly admired by the general populace. They were seen as the good guys who wanted to protect Israel's sacred traditions. You have to remember, there was some ambiguity in the Mosaic Law where things weren't completely spelled out in black and white. For example, the Sabbath. According to the Old Testament law, it stated that any work on that day was strictly forbidden. Well, the question that emerged for the Pharisees was, what constitutes as work? So they compiled a list of 39 forbidden activities you could not perform on the Sabbath. Now, this is really, really important to understand as we read the Gospels, because when Jesus is going after the Pharisees, he's not attacking their goals for purity and obedience. Rather, he is attacking their hypocrisy. Jesus accused them of saying one thing, but doing another. Mark 7, 8 through 12. In other words, they became so obsessed with externals while neglecting the more important things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Matthew 22, 23 through 24. Now it's easy to look down on the Pharisees as hypocrites, but that is very common in all religious traditions. It is so easy to follow a form of religion and miss its substance. I want to ask a question. The general idea of the Pharisees was, if we're going to get the land of Israel back under Israeli control and away from the Romans, then we need to be completely obedient to all of the statutes that God gave us. And until we do so, Israel will continue to live under pagan rule. In other words, these pagan Romans are going to continue to have their feet on our necks until we reform our ways and get back to the law. And the Jews despised the idea of being ruled or governed by the Gentiles. So were the Pharisees really in the wrong? The Sadducees the word Sadducee probably comes from the name Zadok, and it is believed that the Sadducees traced their lineage back to the high priest Zadok, who officiated King David's reign in 1 Chronicles 16.39. And the Sadducees were actually a small group, numerically speaking, but they had widespread influence in politics and religion. Josephus tells us they were educated elites in Israel. Many of them were wealthy, so you can see why the masses who were poor would not side with them. So you have these two primary groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who did not necessarily see eye to eye. We read in Acts 22, 6 through 10, but perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. I'm on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. As he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began arguing heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. So you can see that there was a deep contrast or division between these two parties. The Sadducees, as Luke said, did not believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection or what we would call a human spirit or soul. The Sadducees did, however, believe in a human free will as opposed to predestination or determinism while the Pharisees were divided on this view. Well, in the next slide there is an excerpt from Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, and this will corroborate nicely with Luke's account, adding clarity to the differences between these two parties, and then I'll explain why. <laughs> 
Josephus on the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees have delivered to the people a great many observances and succession from their fathers, which are not written in the Law of Moses, and for that reason it is that the Sadducees reject them and say that we are not to esteem those observances to be obligatory, which are in the written word, but are not to observe what are not derived from the tradition of our forefathers. And concerning these things, it is that great disputes have arisen among them, while the Sadducees are able to persuade none but the rich, and have not the populace obsequies to them, but the Pharisees have the multitude on their side. Josephus, Antiquities, 13.10.6 So you can see that the Sadducees rejected the resurrection, angels, and immortality, primarily because to them it was not taught in the Torah or Law of Moses, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. In other words, the Sadducees viewed resurrection and the like as going beyond the teachings of the Pentateuch. They only considered the first five books to be authoritative. They did not reject the prophets or the writings, they just didn't view them at the same level as the Torah. And the Sadducees challenged Jesus on the resurrection, if you recall, in Matthew 22. Matthew 22, 23-33 On that day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife, and raise up the children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So also the second, and the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they had all married her. I love what Jesus says here. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what is spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Now it's important to point out here that Jesus is dealing with the Sadducees. Again, remember, they don't adhere to books beyond the Torah, or the first five books. But Jesus is quoting directly from the Torah. So which group do you think Jesus fell into? Based on what we know about the Pharisees and Jesus, I think we could conclude that he leans towards this party, but remained neutral. We do know that St. Paul was a Pharisee as he sat under the great Gamaliel, and St. Paul said that he was a Pharisee in his beliefs in both Acts and Philippians. Scribes. The scribes are also known as teachers of the law and lawyers in the Gospels. They were experts in the exposition and interpretation of the law of Moses. In other words, they had really large memory banks where they could recite scripture verbatim. Oftentimes they would memorize enormous chunks or all of the Old Testament and quote it perfectly. In fact, they were actually forbidden from quoting unless it was done with razor sharp accuracy. Now the scribes date their origins to the time of Ezra after the Babylonian exile. So they too have a history that goes back to Ezra, who after the Babylonian exile established Judaism based on the law. Ezra 7.10 says, Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord, and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. And this role as a scribe was not something that was inherited. Rather, it was earned based on your ability and knowledge of scripture. Now yet again, we think in negative terms of the scribes, but there was a high regard for them among the people in Jesus. Jesus actually spoke of the validity of the office in Matthew 13, 52. He said, each teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old.
The Zealots Luke tells us that one of Jesus' twelve disciples was named Simon the Zealot, while the other evangelists or gospel writers refer to him as Sinon the Canaanite. These were men who had religious zeal for the honor of Israel's God against anyone or anything that threatened to diminish his honor. There are certain Old Testament figures who were zealous for God, such as Elijah and Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron who burned with zeal and took drastic measures to stop the Baal worship. Also, last week, we spoke of the incident in Modin where Mattathias burned with zeal when a fellow Israelite burned incense to pagan deities. St. Paul, in his New Testament letter to the churches in Galatia, said he had great zeal for his ancestral traditions. This group of zealots were actually despised by the first century historian Josephus, who blamed them for much of the Jewish war. These zealots were likely responsible for a lot of problems that occurred in Israel. For example, while they're not mentioned by name in Matthew's Gospel, during the uprising in Jerusalem under Archelaus, son of Herod, we find out in Acts 5 that a zealot by the name of Judas the Galilean was responsible for some of what took place. Josephus actually refers to them as Sicarii, men armed with daggers who would mingle in the crowds at Jewish festivals and stab unsuspecting Jews who had any ties with Roman officials. So these people were extremely zealous to get Israel out of Roman pagan control by any means necessary. Think about the two men on either side of Jesus during the crucifixion. We often understand them to be robbers, but that was not who they were. These men were like Barabbas who were not ordinary robbers. These men were insurgents against Roman power. In fact, Mark tells us that Barabbas was among the rebels in prison who committed murder in Mark 15:7. The Essenes or Qumran community. We actually know quite a bit about the Essene, thanks in part to people like Philo of Alexandria, Pliny the Elder, and of course Josephus. But this particular group is not even mentioned in the Gospels or the rest of the New Testament for that matter. So why are we bringing them into the Gospel survey? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they help us understand what was going on during the early part of the first third of the first century. Now, like the Pharisees and Essenes who grew out of the Hasidim movement during the Maccabean Revolt, they actually shared similar beliefs with the Pharisees, but they were even more of a separatist group. They held onto the law with an even firmer grip than the Pharisees. In fact, they refused to offer up animal sacrifices at the temple because they regarded the temple as polluted by corruption. Philo says that the Essenes practiced extreme piety and asceticism, abstaining from pleasure. They did not marry. Rather, they recruited young men who sought to live lives of purity. They wore the same clothes and they shared everything. Pliny the Elder, he couldn't stand them. He actually says that on the west side of the Dead Sea, just far enough from its shore to avoid its baneful influences, lived the Essenes. They live without women, they live without money, and without the company save that of the palm trees, and no one is born into the community. But as we discuss their lifestyle, they have a striking resemblance of a significant New Testament figure. A Christian point of view are very important. Now, there's no reference in the scrolls to Jesus himself. No, no, no. The scrolls do not refer to Jesus or to any Christian. But there, there is a view that um, his cousin John, John the Baptist as we know him, may have been significantly influenced by the Essene community, these uh, uh, sectarian holy men who uh, had this uh, little uh, community down in Qumran. That's a possibility. There are several interesting parallels between John the Baptist, his uh, being out in the wilderness, his reference to Isaiah 40, verse 3, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness, uh, his strange, very strict diet. There are various reasons for thinking that John may have had, at some point in his life, uh, association with the Essenes. However, the John we encounter in the Gospels, who invites sinners to come to him to the Jordan River and be baptized, that's so out of step yeah. with the Essene perspective that we, our assumption is if John had been connected to the Essenes at some time in his life, he certainly was not by the time we find him in the Gospels uh, preaching and, and baptizing. Essenes is E-double-S-E-N-E-S. -S -E -S. Who were these guys? 
Well, that's an interesting question. We think that they were a priestly group, at least their leadership. They broke away from the uh, aristocratic priestly leadership of Jerusalem, probably in the second century, uh, over a dispute as to how worship should take place, uh, issues of calendar, but also, I think, issues of who is eligible to be the high priest. And so they regarded themselves as descendants of Zadok. And Zadok was the priestly family put in power uh, by King David and his son Solomon. Well, there were non-Zadokite priests in Jerusalem. And so this Zadokite group, we think, began the Essene movement. And they, they had this view that um, the, um, the cities were polluted spiritually and the desert was relatively pure, right? That's right. And so they had to flee the impurity of the city, also the impurity of women. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. This was kind of a celebrate man's only club. That's right. Yeah, not much has changed. Uh, and uh, there is some debate as to whether or not they even existed. Uh, how, how do you feel about that? Oh, that came up very recently. Someone claiming that uh, the Essenes never existed. The whole thing is made up by the first century historian Josephus. Right. The trouble is that uh, a, a person a generation earlier named Philo, another Jew who lived in Alexandria, he knows about the Essenes also. And others refer to the Essenes. I don't think this is a fictional group. Josephus tells us about the Pharisees. Did they exist? Yes. He tells us about the Sadducees. They existed. Well, he also tells us about the Essenes. Is he making this up? I don't think so. We're going to wrap up today's lesson with just a couple quick slides to help us review what we talked about today. This is the political tendencies of the Jewish groups during the first century. Now in the center of the screen, I put the Pharisees. Of course, they would probably fall more towards the spectrum of anti-Roman, but for space, I have them in the center as an anti-Roman group, but still involved in public affairs. To the right of them are the Essenes. The Essenes, if you remember, withdrew from society waiting for God to overthrow the Romans. To the far right and the most extreme group are the Zealots. They were violently anti-Roman and they actively sought to overthrow the government. The more pro-Roman groups were the Sadducees and the Herodians. The Sadducees were supporters of the status quo, very wealthy and favorable towards Roman ideas. The Herodians were active supporters of, of a pro-Roman lifestyle and they were part of the Herodian dynasty. Jewish groups after 70 AD and the destruction of the temple. On the left side of the screen, the destruction of the temple ends Sadducean influence. The Essenes and the Qumran community are destroyed by the Romans in the Jewish war from 66 to 73. The Zealot movement is decimated in AD 70 after the Bar Kokhba Jewish revolt. The only group to survive and that is present today are the Pharisees. After AD 70, Rabbinic Judaism takes over, followed by Orthodox Judaism. The Pharisaic teachings are preserved in Rabbinic Judaism after 70 AD and in modern Judaism.